Besides being what I'm going to serve communion in shortly, this is a hunk of wood. Do we expect this to start burning by itself anytime soon? No, probably not. Right? If we did start it burning, it would burn for quite a while, like the hunk of wood. But what does it take to get wood burning? This is not a trick question. A spark. It takes a flame, a spark, a match. It takes some form of energy to get this to start burning. Now, in science, we have a term for this. It's called activation energy. You have a demonstration of the, the graph. You know it's science because we have graphs. Uh, the graph of that is on your bulletin and on the screen in front of you. The wood is on the left, reactants, which is the sciencey word for what you start with, and on the right, products. If you started burning this, your products would be ash. But it's not going to start burning unless you put some energy into it. Activation energy. That, that's the fancy word for it won't burn unless you get... And you think about the relationship, too. You, you light a match, and it's only a little bit of energy. But how long would this burn? Quite a while, right? A little bit of energy makes a big difference once it's burning, but you got to have that little bit of energy to get the ball rolling, to get something started. So that's called activation energy. It's something, it, it starts something, uh, it gets it going. And, and the activation energy varies, and we know how it varies. If that was a piece of freshly chopped green wood, would it take more energy than something that's dried? and put it in lacquer, that would probably go up like that, right? If it's dry, it's different than if it's wet or if it's green. It, it depends upon uh, the wood that, that we're going to burn. So activation energy changes based upon what's good, what we're starting. Okay, keep that in mind. And, and we're going to talk about the Hebrew people that are in bondage in Egypt. They're going to end up in a better place. They're in a place of high energy. They're slaves. This is not a good thing. And they're going to end up in the promised land on the right. That's where they're going to go. But it takes a certain kick to get that, that started. It takes a certain activation energy to, to, to start the journey of the Hebrew people to leave slavery and head towards the promised land. If it takes matches to start a fire, what does it take to get the Hebrew people moving? What's it take? <laughs> yeah, what's God do? Plagues, right? The ten plagues. That is sort of the activation energy of this story. And, and in the same way that it takes a, a different amount of energy to start dry wood versus green wood, it, would it takes a differing number of plagues based upon how stubborn Pharaoh is. How stubborn is Pharaoh? We can quantify it. He's ten plagues stubborn. That's really stubborn, isn't it? That's amazingly stubborn. Pharaoh is very wet and very green, if you, if, to follow the, the analogy. It's worth noting that with these plagues, there's a lot of suffering that goes on in here, right? There's a lot that happens. Uh, insects come and crops are damaged and devoured. Hail comes and, and hurts livestock. Uh, water, uh, the, the water of the Nile is turned to blood and can't exactly fish when, when it's water is blood, right? Uh, boils. I, I don't think you're going to get a lot of work out of people when they're covered in boils. And in the end, you have the death of the firstborn uh, of the people of Egypt. So it turns out that Pharaoh has a really high activation energy. It's going to take a lot to get him moving. And if you imagine what that would have been like for the people of Egypt, there's a few times in this story where Pharaoh's servants look at him and say, Dude, just let them go. This is just whooping us. Would you please just, just give it up already? And that's my translation of it. But that's what happens. And so, but these plagues keep on happening. And can you imagine how much easier it would have been for the people if Pharaoh had given in at five plagues? Or maybe even at seven. Like, it just would have been a lot better for Egypt if Pharaoh had said, you know, after five, okay, you got me, right? I'll, I'll give. Right? Um, 
yes, we are talking about plagues, and, and yes, uh, we could get into the details of the specific plagues, and, and God, and nature, and, and what it actually is the miracle here. Um, we're not going to do that today. I think we can acknowledge that if they said, if people from uh, 3,000 years ago said that locusts show up, showed up and ate all of their crops, that they're not stupid, and that's really what happened. So I think we're just going to say, uh, just take it at face value. They said plagues happened. Okay, right, well, we can come back to the details of the plagues later. That's not the focus of the day. The focus of the day is why does it take so many plagues before Pharaoh gives in? Like, think about it. If you were Pharaoh, how many plagues do you think it would have taken you before you would have said, okay, you got me, right? The reason it takes so many, because we read, is that Pharaoh hardens his heart. And I appreciate that the English keeps on using the same verb, harden. Uh, the Hebrew actually uses three different verbs that get at the same idea of hardening, but I think it's instructive to, to note the, what, it, what those three verbs are to help us understand. When we're saying someone has a hard heart, the three verbs are uh, kaved, when something becomes heavy, like corpulent, like I'm just going to sit here and you can't make me move. You know what that's like, right? And just settle in, and this is where I'm going to be. Uh, or a hazak is the second verb. To be strongly stubborn, like a, a mule that just won't move, or how I think of it, a car that just won't start. It just ain't going to start. Doesn't matter how many times you turn it over, not going to start. It's not going anywhere. Right? Or kasa, to be hard, uh, to be stiff-necked, to look in a certain direction, to put on your blinders and go, no, 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 I don't hear anything. Like, that, that's what... That's that's what's happening here. The hardness of art is to be heavy and stubborn and to ignore everything else that going, is going on because I'm right. And, and this happens 20 times in the story. 20 times uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. 10 of those times Pharaoh hardens his own heart and 10 of those times God hardens his heart. And the order matters. Because if you look at it, it's the first five plagues. Plagues one through five, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Plague six, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Plague seven is kind of the last chance. Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And from eight and out, God hardens his heart. And so what we make of this, at least what I make of this, is that we know how decision making goes. If someone asks you to do something and you say no the first time and they come back and ask you again, are you going to say anything different? And if they ask you again and 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 again, I think that's 10, right? At what point do you just say no, 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 right? He's, we, we get stuck into, once we've said no to something, we just kind of dig in, right? And, and I think that's what's happening here. Pharaoh has a legitimate and real choice. He could have said after the first plague, after the second plague, after the fifth plague, okay, you got me, take them. But after that, after the seventh plague, is the last time, everything after seven, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. We read of, of how God handles this. It's in Psalm 81, we read, But my people did not listen to my voice, Israel would not submit, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Like, part of God's judgment is sometimes to give you exactly what you're being stubborn over, right? You're going to be stubborn over this? Fine. I'll give you exactly what you want, right? And so that, I think that's what is happening here. God is involved in this and has convinced Moses to get involved. And Moses goes to, uh, and Mo Moses could have said no, right? Goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh could have said yes, Pharaoh could have said no, and Pharaoh was making a very real decision. He could have let the people go. We could be talking about the seven plagues of Egypt right now, but Pharaoh is ten plagues stubborn. That's how stubborn he is. That, that's the activation energy. That's how much energy you got to put into this system. So the opposite of Pharaoh in Scripture would be David. David, we call him the man after God's own heart. And, and do we call him the man after God's own heart because he's perfect? No. He did, you know, rape 
Bathsheba and then murder the husband so that he could marry Bathsheba. Like, that's bad. Very bad thing, right? And, and then Nathan comes to him and says, you did this. And, and David doesn't say, no, I didn't. Because the king did it, that makes it right, right? It's, that's not what David says. David says, you got me, right? You're right. I, I have done wrong. And, and Nathan says, the, the, the plague here, the consequence is that this child of Bathsheba will die. And we're not going to get into the, the challenge of understanding children dying. That's a different sermon. But the point being, David is a kind of a one plague man, right? One consequence. David is told this horrible thing's going to happen because of your sin and other people are going to suffer from it. And David doesn't dig in and say, I'm right. David repents. And, and we get this 51st Psalm, the Psalm of David, where he writes, have mercy on me. Wash me from my iniquity. I know my transgressions and my sin is before me. Against you have I sinned. Right? So what makes David the man after God's own heart is not that he is perfect, but that he, instead of taking ten plagues, it takes one. Now, I would love to say, can we all be one plague person, people? Wouldn't that be nice? Everyone here, one plague people. It would be an odd moniker to be able to claim, you know what, I'm a one plague person. I think I, we need to be real. i got to be realistic. I'm, I'm shooting for three. Right? That's my goal. I want to be a three plague person. I, I, I hope I definitely give in by four. Right? But I don't want to uh, have people suffering for my idiocy. Because that's the horror of this, right? Like Pharaoh was so stubborn and others suffered because of it. And, and David was was, did something stupid and others suffered. But he stopped and then he turned it around as soon as, as he saw as soon as he listened and heard. And, and so to, to again use this idea of how much does it take to get that fire started, right? How do we make it so that we light on fire quicker? How do we make sure that our, our wood is dry? How do we make sure that we, we respond quickly? But if we look at Pharaoh, uh, the fundamental thing there is that he is not listening and people are suffering for it. And, and so I, I think, well, while I doubt that anyone here is causing the suffering of an entire people, I do think that we do cause the suffering of others. And the scary thing about how we cause the suffering of others is that we can get comfortable with it. So Andy and Olivia got married on June 17th in 2006. And she started her job at Buckland, uh, K-12 Music, and, uh, and I started my first church, uh, Buckland in Mount Zion. And I was just overwhelmed because people are looking at me and calling me pastor. Right? What are they? Trust me? Right? This is crazy. And so I did what came naturally. I worked. Hard. I went to like every single meeting in town. I studied for the sermons at great length. And I, like, I spent a lot of time in, in the office. And I am embarrassed and ashamed to admit that there were too many nights where I came home and I would walk in to hear, you remember the Law and Order? Dun dun! That, that sound at that, that, the beginning of Law and Order. And you know how they would roll one into the next? They would roll the credits and then they'd start the next one in. I would walk into the parsonage, and Olivia would be like two or three law and orders in. And we got comfortable, I got comfortable with the fact that I was ignoring my wife. And that was embarrassing, and it's a shameful thing to admit. And it took me listening, realizing, it took a moment like Lent to say, wow, Andy, this is profoundly stupid, right? You need to go over and pay attention to her and listen. Because we've gotten comfortable, but just because we're comfortable with other people suffering from what we're doing doesn't make it right. It just means it's comfortable. Right. That's what Lent is. It's a time that interrupts our life and says it's time to look around and make sure we're listening. 
Right? The, what, what Pharaoh needed to do, desperately needed to do, was to listen. To soften Pharaoh's heart would have meant for him to listen to the people who were suffering and to listen to the God who called him. And because he wasn't doing, willing to do it, others suffered. The core practice of Lent is to listen. Right? To listen to Scripture. To read the Gospel and look at what Jesus cares about. A pr core practice of Lent is to pray, which is to listen to what God calls us to. A core practice of Lent is to fast, which is to intently say, this time, which is usually about me, what I'm going to eat, I'm going to make it about others. And I'm going, excuse me, I'm going to give of what I would have spent on this meal. I'm going to study, I'm going to serve, I'm going to pray, I'm going to do something for another. Confession is another aspect of Lent, which like, if you want to come and you need to struggle with something with me, that's fine. But you can confess to each other. Confession is about speaking to each other honestly and listening and be able to say things like, I think I'm not paying enough attention to my wife. Like, I think something needs to change here. What it will look like for each of us varies, but it is something that we, I believe we need to take this season to look at. Like, and I'll tell you, this, this is just what I'm doing for Lent. I have known for years that the Kuhn family needs to spend some time together in a worship type setting. And you'll notice, where's my family right now? Like, we are very scattered on Sunday. My wife is playing piano one Sunday a month. My, my daughter's in CCD. My son likes it here because this is a better playroom than over at the Catholic Church. So he wants to be here. But <laughs> the point being, like we're, we're scattered all over the place on Sunday. And, and my kids are eight and, eight and five, I think. Uh, I've known this for a while, right? And it's like a year and a half ago, I actually sat down and I typed up, like, this is what we should do together. We should light a candle and read some of the gospel and ask each other what we want to pray about and then do the Lord's Prayer. And like, that's it. This is nothing complicated. But we should do that once a week together so that we as a family are doing this together. So that we're listening to each other and we're listening to God. And you know how long I've, I've known this? I've known this for years. Like, I'm confessing to you on this. I've been like a foreplay person. I have not done something I've known I should have done for years. And, and, and Friday, we did it for the first time. And, and it wasn't amazingly smooth. Like, the kids are slightly confused. They'll learn. Right? But listening. Like, this is what I have to do. And that's very specific to me. What is it that you're going to do so that you listen? As a family or to each other, to people in the community, whatever it is. I want to invite you to a Lenten practice so that we might become three plague people. That we might not be comfortable with uh, others suffering for how we fall short. And so here is the invitation to Lent. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the day of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual pre preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for baptism. It was also during this time when persons who had committed serious sins and separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite each of you then, all of you, in the name of the church to observe a holy Lent by self-examination, repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, by reading and meditating on God's holy word. That's what we're entering the season of this time of Lent. I invite you to join me in listening to our neighbors and to God and, and whatever it looks like for you. Let's listen. Let's soften our hearts so that we might be three plague people. Amen.